but des despite the sort of sad trajectory, the sad overall trajectory of the of the UFW, United Farm Workers Union, within that trajectory, there are um, there are countless inspiring moments and um, thousands of heroic people and um, wonderful examples of human solidarity and uh, an an epic struggle for justice that lasted 20 years, lasted a whole generation. And all of it deserves to be remembered. So the, the union begins um, in, in, I would say, sort of an interesting way. Um, what unites the, the the farm workers, particularly in California, is their faith. Right, they're Catholic. Um, in in you know an area that is you know where they're the minority. Right, they're also immigrants or migrants. They don't have legal status because they are brought into the country on on special visas, um, which means they have to be sponsored by employers which means at any time the employer could send them back or just remove the sponsorship. Right? So they do not have any permanency. First of all, we like, you don't speak and you don't write English. So you, you already, you, you have the, the non-advantage. I was, I was very scary for me. Very, very, uh, very powerful when I realize I need to buy to to school to learn how you know talk how you have to write it down and uh, and the most important listen um, and because the work was uh, remote from view it was you know uh, in the fields right not in the cities not in the towns. Um, one of the, the challenges that they had if they tried to organize um, was no one would see them. No one knew what was going on. Um, and also the farm owners um, could blacklist or, or blackball the, uh, the workers themselves, just never hire them again. And it didn't work initially. It took creativity, it took imagination. They had to adapt, they had to adjust, um, they had to grow. Uh, there's elements of solidarity. Uh, there's elements of nonviolent uh, civil disobedience. The, the reality, I think, is that the workers themselves were, uh, you know, some of the most exploited workers in the United States. They were invisible uh, in the fields, right? Uh, they were working under very poor conditions, right? It was a pretty abysmal existence. But it was the only one because also there was there was um, tremendous um, discrimination. Well, uh, at the time when um, I moved here, it was in 1993. I'm gonna say early 90s. Oh, uh, very hard times with um, that kind of government. Um, all the doors I was like closing for you because first of all they are required like a, a, a lot of uh, paperwork sometimes because uh, you you age you don't have and they request also the sprints. You know, it, there's a lot to lose. You know, um, the movement worked, but the story that's not told <laughs> is how many people. Although the movement may have worked, how many people lost their jobs and after the after the farm workers gained rights didn't get their jobs back? How many people over the course of the movement weren't able to put food on their table for their children and really suffered uh, so that it sacrificed so that the larger movement could be uh, successful? So you have a lot of poor people who had very thin margins, who put a lot on the line, everything on the line for it. So it's like a wall after wall after wall. Well, one of the things that's interesting about the, the that particular Viva La Causa, you know, farm worker movement with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, 
um, is that, you know, it was begun, you know, by sort of the Filipino workers in those, uh, in those great growing fields. And it was really the, the sort of Mexican and Mexican American workers were hesitant to join at first. They, they felt as though they weren't ready. There was this feeling of we're not ready. We're not ready. And then finally, um, finally the decision was made that no, now is the time. Larry Itliang was president of the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, known as AWOC. Summer of 65, he began to talk about organizing, improving the working conditions, and increasing the salaries. Uh, we feel that we farm workers uh, should have an organization of our own. One of the things that most people forget is that it was the Filipinos in September 1965, he started the grape strike. It begins with a strike at the Delano uh, vineyards, the grape growing um, uh, vineyards. But the strike starts to lose momentum. The strike is only doing so much. And the strike, although it gains some attention and puts pressure on a particular um, uh, grower, it's it's not leading to the change that's needed. Cesar Chavez, who is the, the major leader, um, he has a long history of of, um, of activity in the fields and organization in the fields. So in the 60s and 70s, there was a series of, of great boycotts. And that became well known because the, um, you know, folks could not buy grapes and support the workers. And that put pressure on the farm owners to uh, settle contracts with the workers themselves. So what the United Farm Workers were able to do is they were able to create a win-win where they, they created the conditions by which everyone could benefit. And the way they did that ingeniously and creatively is with a seal, the United Farm Workers seal. Well, once they said, well, what can we do? Well, they said, well, if you, if you concede to our, if you meet us, if you negotiate with us, if you recognize our rights, we'll endorse your grapes and we'll put the United Farm Workers seal. Now everyone who's not buying table grapes, the consumers now have a win because now they can go back and purchase what they want, but they can do it ethically. The farm workers would boycott, protest, march and fast their way to a collective bargaining agreement, which guaranteed field workers, among other things, increased pay and the right to unionize. It's been long way for the last uh, 29 years I've been uh, in New York City uh, I, I have a great opportunities in, in, in New York City like uh, I will never change those kind of experience working with the bad chefs um, is the best group.